Good morning. This is Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center. I have 10 o'clock, so we're going to get things rolling. Thank you for joining us this morning for the next in our series of webinars from the Active Transportation Academy. Today's webinar is a preview of the Community Traffic Calming Program, which is available um, through the Active Transportation Academy at no cost um, for local agencies, um, throughout Ohio and I'm very pleased that we have Kim Burton from Burton Planning with us today as our presenter this morning. So I think that's all I needed to say other than maybe the fact that um, we'll be taking questions through the chat pod on the left hand side of your screen throughout Kim's presentation and I will read those off to her as they come in but we will also open the phone lines up at the end of the webinar um, for you know, audio questions if you'd like to ask them. Additionally, I am attempting to record the webinar, so if um, I'm successful with that, then I will definitely have it posted um, to the website later and send everyone a link. But in case it doesn't work, you're here, and I know, Kim, you're ready to go, right? Yes, I am. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As Victoria mentioned, uh, my name is Kimberly Burton, President of Burton Planning Services, and Burton Planning Services is currently uh, managing the Active Transportation Academy contract for the Department of Transportation. So my role is to serve as a project executive on the contract, but I've also been one of the course developers and in course instructors. And so um, today we're going to do a quick overview of what the Active Transportation Academy is for those of you that are new to that. And then we're going to talk about what you'll get out of the full course for the learning outcomes. And then we've pulled out some of the main topics from the four-hour course, including defining what traffic calming is, benefits and challenges associated with traffic calming, the toolkit that will be uh, going through during the training of different measures you can use, and then the main components of what would go into a community traffic calming program. So first, the Active Transportation Academy. Um, the, the purpose of the, the Active Transportation Academy with the Department of Transportation is to offer training to help communities to reach their active transportation goals. As Victoria mentioned, these are free trainings and workshops. So communities throughout Ohio can apply for these free trainings. And then instructors such as me or one of the other, my other teammates would come out to your community to conduct these trainings. So they're open to any local jurisdiction, such as a school or school district, uh, a village, township, city, health department, um, MPO, RPC, um, any, any kind of jurisdictions like that we can work with and come to your locale. Also, ODOT has set up professional development credits for attendees for these courses. So if you're looking for uh, your planning credentials or engineering credential renewals, uh, this will help for that. Uh, so if uh, you haven't been on the Active Transportation Academy page, I put the link here on the PowerPoint. Uh, and if you want to navigate ODOT's website, it's under the Planning Division, under LTAP, and then there's an Active Transportation Academy page. So for those of you that are somewhat familiar with the Academy, it used to be called the Safe Routes Academy. We recently rebranded the Safe Routes Academy to the Active Transportation Academy in order to reflect a more broad offering of courses. And so all of the old courses are still available. It's just we are offering additional courses now, too. So three of the brand new courses that we just rolled out in the last few months are the Community Traffic Calming Programs, which is what we're talking about today. It's a four-hour course, uh, conducting walk and, and or bike audits, a four-hour course, and then Health and Equity and Transportation, another four-hour course. So the other courses that are available, uh, the first group are the Train the Trainer courses, and that includes walking school bus training, crossing guard training, girls in gear training, and conducting a school walk audit, and all those are four hours long. And in addition, we have 
quite a few of the Safe Routes to School training and implementation programs. So the first one is the school lesson plans, and that's a full day. And then we also have developing school travel plans, non-infrastructure implementation, incorporating Safe Routes to School into wellness, school and community policy and planning, and then safety in active transportation, school and community planning. So these are all courses that have been offered in the past that we are continuing to offer. So also coming soon, these are courses that we're currently working on that should be available sometime this year. Uh, so right now we're doing a pilot online on-demand course that we're developing for the Active Transportation Academy for the Crossing Guard training. So when that is complete, you'll be able to go on the website and actually take it whenever you please. And then the other three courses are in-person courses. So first one we're working on is a Vision Zero Action Plan, which is related to traffic safety and towards zero deaths. And then we have a complete streets implementation training and then an advocacy training. So let's get into the Community Traffic Calming Programs course. Uh, so today's webinar, just as a reminder, it's, it's a preview of the four-hour in-person course. So most topics for the in-person course will be highlighted today, but there's a few that we aren't talking about today due to limited time, but I will run through the full in-person course agenda here at the end and talk about the activities and what you would actually be doing if you did this course. Uh, so the in-person course does provide more details and uh, so there's some hands-on activities to really uh, offer lots of different ways to learn about traffic calming. So with the full course, there are six learning outcomes. First is really establishing a good understanding of what traffic calming is, the importance of it, and some of the challenges that go along with it. Second is recognizing the connections of traffic calming to other programs. So um, really getting into what kind of problems does traffic calming address, how do they contribute to um, other programs and what kind of issues are you are trying to work through. And then, you know, safe routes to school, after, active transportation plans, tactical urbanism, traffic safety, all of these uh, really connect up. So we're going to go through each of those during the course and talk about how they can play off each other. Third learning art outcome is getting familiar with all of the main traffic calming measures that are out there. I'll talk about it a little bit today, but just all the different types of solutions that can go into the toolkit. The fourth learning outcome is recognizing the effectiveness of traffic calming measures. So the non-physical measures, the physical measures, how to evaluate their effectiveness, and then identifying scenarios and local examples where they could be beneficial. And then the last two learning out outcomes first is possessing practical knowledge of traffic calming program components. Uh, so understanding how to put a policy and the elements together, how to put a project development process together for the program, recognizing how the public should be integrated into the process, and then also understanding how you can fund some of the measures. And then the, the last learning outcome is understanding how to create the program. So what are the steps to go through setting it up? Um, how, what do you have to do to like create committees and processes and resolutions? Understanding how what you need to do to make sure it's successful and what kind of resources are out there to assist in your implementation. So really, our goal is to take you full circle on traffic calming. It's We're going to start the basics and introduce you to the fundamentals, and we'll take you all the way through the end on how step-by-step um, step you can actually set this up in your community. So getting into some of the highlighted topics in the course, we're going to first start with what is traffic calming. So I pulled a definition out of um, ITE. So traffic calming involves changes in street alignment, installation of barriers, and other physical measures to reduce traffic speeds and or cut through volumes in the interest of street safety, livability, and other public purposes. Uh, so 
What's interesting is this really focuses only on the physical measures, but it's a good start to a definition of what traffic calming is. So really traffic calming is the physical engineering measures, but it's also non-engineering, non-physical measures. So the idea is we want to address traffic volume and speed, walking and bike safety, the street appearance, and concerns of the residents. So the benefits and challenges to this, uh, for the community, what the reason traffic calming is beneficial is a lot of the measures are and can be inexpensive and flexible. Uh, the traffic calming also reduces collision frequency and severity. It reduces cut through traffic. It can be paired with aesthetic improvements and streetscapes that you're already working on. It improves the quality of life and it can encourage placemaking and revitalization related to economic development. Some challenges include still, even though some of the measures are inexpensive, you still have to find funding to pay for them. And then often there's some conflict between balancing the needs and desires of a neighborhood versus motorists that are trying to drive through the neighborhoods. And specifically related to active transportation, active transportation benefits for traffic calming includes making streets safer and more comfortable for pedestrians and bicyclists um, because vehicle speeds and volumes really are directly related to injury and fatality rates, especially in pedestrians and bicyclists. And uh, vehicle speeds and volumes are inversely related to pedestrian and bicyclist comfort. Some of the challenges related to active transportation, uh, some of the measures can result in possible barriers or impediments to active transportation facilities and users, such as putting in speed bumps or closing roads. So traffic calming measures need to be selected so that the implementation can be designed appropriately to accommodate and or promote active trans transportation, such as if you're putting in speed bumps, build in gaps that bicycle tires can fit through, or if you're closing a road, still maintain an access for pedestrians and cyclists. So let's talk a little bit about the toolkit that we'll go over in the class. So hopefully the three E's look somewhat familiar to many of you that are familiar with Safe Routes to School. So the toolkit is really around the three E's of education, enforcement, and engineering. It's important to keep in mind that starting with education and enforcement is really your first step. Uh, it's good to see if you can use programs or policies to first um, address any kind of issues before you invest the time and the money in engineering solutions. However, if you do get to a point where you need engineering solutions, then doing all three together, it really is the most effective way to address traffic calming issues. So for the first group of, e group of E's, that's your education. Uh, so getting neighbors involved is um, critical to getting traffic calming programs up and running and to addressing some issues up front. So discussing traffic issues with your neighbors, um, walking and biking and driving and parking habits in your neighborhood. And then also modeling and teaching safe walking and biking habits and approaches for people in your neighborhood. And then also just understanding what the law is, where, where and how should people be walking and biking. The next group of E's is enforcement. So partnering with local law enforcement to reduce speeds in unsafe areas is another pretty effective measure. So you can request uh, speed monitoring trailers, such as the photo here on the right that you see. Um, you can organize a neighborhood speed watch. So th there's things that you can do, like I said, that are not engineering focused that can help. So for engineering, uh, w when do you use it? So really, once you've had continued complaints and or documentation of speeding after you've tried the education enforcement options, that's when you start looking at engineering. 
So new developments, road network alterations, or other changes do increase cut through traffic. And um, so the lack of behavior change after the sustained education enforcement is really when you uh, change over to engineering solutions. So the engineering solutions are usually grouped into two main categories, speed management and volume management. So for the speed management, there's quite a few measures. The first group is usually centered around vertical measures. So we've got speed bumps, lumps, humps, and all the different ones in between, uh, speed tables. So there's different ways that you can raise the elevation of your pavement to cause motorists to slow down. Uh, then for horizontal measures, that's traffic circles, lane narrowings, uh, diverters, those types of treatments where it causes motorists to have to uh, move horizontally, which naturally slows them down. And then other measures include adding in streetscapes, pedestrian bike facilities, textured pavement, Anything like that can visually cause motorists to take a notice of an area and cause them to slow down. So there's a photo here on the right that's from the Dayton area, which you can see we've got some textured pavement in the form of pavers and then some really nice streetscapes. And this area, people are not speeding through because they've got the streetscape to look at. They've got the pavers, and it just naturally causes people to slow down. So then uh, there's the volume management measures. So ways to restrict motorists, the number of motorists from using a road. So that can go include partial or full closures of a road from motorists, um, diverters, medium barriers to prevent turns, uh, road diets. Uh, so you can see here in the picture, this is a partial closure. So uh, and a diverter here, so they're still maintaining access for bikes, which is really critical. Um, and also keeping in mind with these engineering measures that you can look at permanent and temporary measures. So um, that's kind of where the tactical urbanism, if you've heard of that, comes in. It's a method of putting in place temporary measures to see how it can affect how people use and relate to the road. So what's nice with the temporary measures is you can try quite a few things out for a really low cost and move them around and adjust them before you put in the more expensive permanent measures. So let's talk about what goes into the program. The major components include project initiation, project development, project approval, project implementation, and project evaluation. The reason I'm showing it there in a circle is that really the important part is that once you get to the project evaluation stage, if something's not working, you want to start kind of over at the project initiation stage then and think about what adjustments do you need to make and go through the process again until that you get to a point where it's working. So our, our first step then is project initiation. So that typically starts with a resident or a neighborhood group applying to the traffic calming program, and then the application is selected for consideration. So once the application is selected, you convene a group of stakeholders to help identify what issues and needs are truly in that area. And then you establish an official committee to uh, keep the process going, to review solutions, and to um, serve as a sounding board for the process. So potential people that could be stakeholders and or on the committee are public and private. So on the public side, you can look at uh, elected and appointed officials, local transportation agencies, schools, safety services, like police and fire serving on as stakeholders. And then on the private side, if there's a neighborhood association, um, local advocacy groups for biking and walking, uh, local businesses that would be affected by the uh, potential measures, 
and then making sure that you're incorporating any underserved populations in the area so they have a voice also. So after the application is selected, then you move on to project development. And so during project development is where you're going to identify and develop traffic calming measures or a measure to mitigate the issues that have been identified. So as part of this, you're going to hold neighborhood meetings to discuss the perceived uh, traffic issues. Uh, staff and the committee will review related traffic data and related data to determine and refine what those issues are. And then uh, the staff and committee will use the toolkit that's part of the program to consider measures for mitigation. So as part of your program, you'll have a pre-made toolkit of all the measures that your community is supportive of considering for traffic calming. And then you pull up the toolkit and look at what fits for this specific neighborhood. And then it's also really important to keep in mind that you want to maintain documentation during this part of the process, and really for the whole process, but you specifically want to make sure that how um, the measures have been selected, that really the process is based on objective data, it's following procedures, and that you're documenting all the decisions you're making in case anything is ever um, confused later on, challenged later on, or just if there's a changeover in staff or people, you can go back and see what that was decided and why. So the third step then is project approval. So that involves approving a specific traffic calming measure or measures for implementation. So approval is needed not just by staff and the committee, but also by the neighborhood residents and the stakeholders. So you want to make sure that everyone is on board before you start trying to implement anything. So that often includes a planning commission, if you have one in your community, a city or village council, or other appointed and elected officials that need to be part of the process. Uh, and, and so it also important in your program is to have kind of a preset minimum for participation. So in your policy, you're going to say, that we need at least 50% of people to participate and, and at least half, more than half of them should say yes to the solution. And that way you have a good documented process. Kim, we've got one question that's coming mm -hmm. in the chat pod. It says, in your opinion, how important is it to complete before after traffic counts when suggesting neighborhood traffic calming measures? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that here toward the end, but the more that you can document, especially if you're doing a volume-related uh, uh, measure, the more you can document how effective it is, uh, the more successful you'll be uh, convincing neighbors of it and, and also for future projects. So uh, and like I said, we'll talk about it a little bit more here in a second, but it definitely is a strong component of what you want to be doing. Okay. So the next step then is project implementation. So that's involving uh, preparing engineering design level plans and then also constructing and or installing the measures depending on what's going in. Uh, so keep in mind that at this point you could consider temporary options. You can see in the photo here on the right that there's some, uh, that's not a two-code uh, bike lane, but you can see that we've got some cones and some flowers that were just put down to see, you know, what will people use, how will they use it, and is it wide enough, and how will motorists react to it. So you can consider something like this first before you spend the money in putting the striping down or the medians down or the bollards down that are more permanent. And then also important at this step is to make sure you're identifying um, who's taking care of it. So if it's a speed bump that's going down or striping that's going down, who's going to be maintaining that? If you're putting in some landscaping in a permanent capacity, who's going to be taking care of that? So because uh, the important thing here is that whatever you're doing is going to be kept up, maintained, and be successful. So the fifth step then is project evaluation. So um, in this step, 
it's not uh, really a required step, but it's something that I think is very important that you incorporate, if at all possible, where you're including this post-implementation evaluation to see how effective it is uh, that you've installed or built. And so this is re really where our traffic counts come in. And so s typically, uh, when you're assessing how successful a implemented measure is, spe speed and volume counts are the primary metrics that are used in these assessments. So the other thing that's good with evaluation, other than just showing whether it's successful or not, is it gives you that chance to refine what you've implemented. And so you could either take something out, relocate it, tweak it, redesign it. If you're showing at this point that maybe after conducting the pre and post traffic counts that your volumes really aren't being reduced the way you need them to be. Or if you have put in bike lanes and they're maybe they're just too narrow you can find out whether people are using them. Uh, or if people are just still speeding because the traffic bumps maybe aren't tall enough to deter people to slow down. Kim, we have one yep. more question come mm -hmm. in. What are the legal implications for placing temporary calming measures within the roadway right-of-way? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think if you're familiar with tactical urbanism, very often that happens outside of uh, governmental agencies and neighbors go out and just uh, put landscaped uh, trees in the road, whether it's legal or not, so they can kind of make a point of what needs to be done. So what's good is that if you build this into your traffic calming program and policy for your community, and temporary measures are part of that process, and everyone is involved through the public, and it's approved at all the levels by following this process, uh, you're going to be much more covered than if you go out and throw a couple uh, mums in the road like you saw in that photo earlier. Great. Okay, so when we think about the program as a whole, uh, there, there's a lot of things to keep in mind to make sure that this is successful. So stakeholder and community engagement is really key to traffic calming programs being successful. Uh, there, typically initiated in, in the public level, and the neighborhoods, the people there are the ones that are going to be living with the results. So having them as partners throughout the process, making sure you have champions that are helping promote the process, both stakeholder and neighborhoods, uh, this is uh, really, really important. And also making sure, as I mentioned earlier, that you're getting the participation rates you need. So you're not going out and putting in speed bumps or bike lanes in a neighborhood where, you know, only maybe two people out of a hundred really want them. Um, and it's also important to very carefully navigate concerns. So address them throughout your process instead of just moving ahead and putting something in. So that way, once again, you've got people on board with what you're doing. Um, and I've mentioned the temporary and permanent measures already, but looking at ways that you can try things out first. Uh, it's low, like I said, lower cost, it's a good way to tweak things, and um, one thing I haven't mentioned, it also offers visibility to the neighbors to show that you really are trying to do something versus the permanent measures sometimes can take longer because of the cost to install. Um, another key to success for implementing traffic calming program is identifying catalytic projects, and what I mean by that is um, when you first set up your program, there's probably a reason you set it up. There's probably one area or a couple areas where there's really some speeding or volume issues and a lot of people are complaining. And starting with one or two of those key projects and following the process very carefully and making sure you've got your champions and your partners and it's a successful process, uh, would result in additional projects later on being more supportive and also it makes it easier for council to approve funding for traffic calming progr uh, programs and projects later on if you've got these projects that you start with that really serve as their own champions to doing more in the future. Uh, another key to success is dedicated funding. In the full training, we do have a list of funding 
that we'll go through and talk about what you can fund here and there. Um, but also, well, you know, a lot of those types of grants and everything that are out there do require local matches. So looking within your community as ways that you can uh, generate revenues or tie uh, to like your paving program that you'll do some things so it's a little cheaper. And also, once again, back to the temporary measures, you can purchase some things that you can reuse, like some removable speed bumps. You can put in temporary speed bumps to try them out and then reuse them in another project later on. So investing a little bit into some of the temporary measures up front can help. But it is important to have a dedicated funding stream so that this is a sustainable program because you don't want uh, to have a roll out this great new traffic calming program and then do two things and two neighborhoods and then not be able to do anything else after that. And the residents and the neighbors, they want to see something that is continued and sustained. And then uh, the last bullet is the performance measurement, and that ties back to that last step, the project evaluation. So that's where you're going in, you're doing your traffic counts, you're um, monitoring speeds, you're looking to see who's using it, how they're using it, and seeing if your initial goals and issues are really being addressed, or if you need to go back, reevaluate it, and try something new. Uh, the the more that you can document what you're measuring, how, how it's measured, and then what the results are, the more that you can demonstrate uh, through a transparent process to constituents and neighbors that uh, these things are effective and they are helping and that their money is being well spent, ultimately. So I did want to show one example here in Central Ohio, uh, City of Grandview recently created a traffic advisory plan back in 2016 that is essentially a, a community traffic calming program. And this was a, a really nice plan because it takes a really proactive approach. It addresses near-term issues, but it also sets protocol for managing future issues. And it's got a really nice section on best practices for traffic mitigation and management in it. Here on the slide, I put a, a link that takes you straight to that document if you are interested in looking at it, the full document. And so within the plan, it has kind of five major components. Uh, first is just, you know, wayfinding how to use the plan. And that's kind of a nice way to introduce this, especially for neighbors and residents that maybe aren't used to looking at traffic and traffic calming like some planners and engineers. Uh, so the other four groups, uh, the first one is the roadway network chapter, and that goes through establishing the existing conditions uh, and making sure that what is out there is documented properly, accurately, and in the right amount of detail so that the issues are quantifiable and um, able to be addressed more effectively that way. The next chapter is their toolkit. So that's their best practices. That's um, them going through all the different traffic calming measures that are out there and having uh, a big list of preferred measures that the community and the elected and appointed leaders support using in their community. And so that's really effective because it puts everything all in one place and you can kind of look through it and say this might work here or I like, I'd like to try that. The next chapter is the process chapter and I'll show you that here a little bit more here in a second but uh, it goes through all of the steps in a pretty easy to understand format and in a flowchart format so that really anyone can step in to this plan and read it and understand what they need to do. And this plan also, another reason we like it is they did put in evaluation criteria and so they've got that performance measurement built in and they do feel it's important to find out what the effects of the implementation of the measures are. Uh, documentation-wise, and also in case anything needs to be adjusted. 
So in the application process, like I said, it's got this really easy to follow flowchart. And um, their time frame from start to finish is about a year with this flowchart. And so you can see here on the right uh, for the first step of the process initiation, um, they've got a flowchart with first you start with your request. Um, there's supporting documentation referred to an appendix. And then they've got interaction with the residents, determining eligibility, a simple yes, no. And then um, if it's a no, they do still consider, you know, whether or not education enforcement or more traditional approaches can be used. So they don't just necessarily throw an application out, but they at least give everything a consideration. And then if it gets a yes and they move on to uh, the community meeting to defining the problems and goals, and then at that point they decide if they want to move forward. And so, like I said, this initiation step is in this nice flowchart. And there's um, more guidance on the left side of the screen explaining it, and then also more documentation in the appendix. So the uh, second step then is their plan development. It takes about three to six months. And that's when you're, um, you're getting your existing conditions, your data, you're analyzing it, and then you're going through that pre-approved toolkit of measures to find out what might work here, what do we like, and then are there any temporary measures that could be considered to test out? And then they move on to the public engagement with community workshop to get everyone's input to screen refine options. And then they can, um, from that, develop a recommendation. And then you can see off on the side there that they have additional stakeholders from safety services, uh, transit providers, advocacy groups for bike ped, um, weighing in at this step. Um, Planning Commission has to uh, review it, and then if there's consensus, then they finalize a plan and they move on. If not, they don't just throw it out, but they actually go back and revise it and address whatever issues came up. So then on to the third step, the design and approvals can take 7 to 12 months. So once the project is prioritized and uh, they start looking for funding. So you can see here one thing I like is that they've got yes, but they also have maybe there's testing for temporary measures and that's where you've got your lower cost options. So maybe they could try some lower cost options before they have funding to do the higher cost permanent options and that also is better for refinement later on. And so once they have at least a little funding for temporary, they try something. If they don't, they put it on hold. And then once they have the full funding, they go through permits, approvals. As the question earlier asked, you know, making sure everything is legal and approved properly. And then the last step then is installation and then evaluation. So that can take... Um, a little while, but basically at the end of that year, th there should be something in place to, to utilize, to evaluate. Uh, so that's where we're integrating possible temporary measures and installing them or the permanent measures. And um, either way, we're collecting data, data and monitoring it and modifying it if needed. And then additional public engagement as needed. And then if um, everyone hates it, then they will look at removing it or modifying it if they don't totally hate it. And then um, once again, as I mentioned before, um, making sure that whatever is implemented is regularly maintained is really important. OK, so just some wrap-up items then. Um, this is what the full course looks like. And so some of this will look familiar with what we talked about today, but there's also some other things built into it. So there's really uh, three main steps along the way in this four-hour class. You start in the classroom, then you go out in the field and do an exercise, and then you um, finish in the classroom. So the start... First, there's introductions, we go through the learning outcomes, define traffic calming, go through the benefits, challenges, connections to other programs, 
and review the toolkit. And so we have uh, some nice activities built into here where you can, we put scenarios before you and you can try different solutions on a map of what could help with the scenarios. Uh, we have some nice printed out maps where we actually do try some roads and some little small model cars to, to see what works and what slows things down appropriately. Uh, then we go out in the field. Uh, we will work with your community to identify something nearby that you feel might be appropriate for this topic. Like if you think there's a really high speed or high volume road that could use some traffic calming right nearby, we can go out and check it out, document it, and come back and actually discuss solutions during the class to really immediately apply what we're learning. Kim, talking about solutions, we had another mm -hmm. question come in. It says, yeah. how do you incorporate snow removal activity and equipment into design? Any examples? Uh, that That's a great question. Um, a lot of times, traffic calming and snow removal do not see eye to eye, as many of you know. So, uh, so traffic bumps and snow removal can be challenging uh, and it's something where that's why it's really important to make sure you've got your emergency services and public service involved in the process because there's ways to incorporate traffic calming that will not make your snow removal folks as angry with you. Um, so it's something where, like with speed bumps, you could maybe put removable ones in that could be taken out during snow emergencies or uh, things that can be plowed around, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I think, was that the main part of the question, Victoria? It was, and, and yeah, I realize okay. this is just an mm -hmm. overview, so I'm yes. sure that's something you can go into more in the yes. actual course if they were to schedule it. Yeah, I think um, one of my favorite little anecdotes with snow removal then are the, uh, if you haven't heard of them, they're called snack downs. Um, so a neck down is a traffic calming um, measure where you narrow an entrance to a roadway, you neck, you basically, you know, pedestrian bump outs. But uh, I saw this article a couple years ago about snack downs or basically uh, when people are snow plowing, uh, they don't always plow the entire width of the road, so they do a natural neck down, and pedestrians like it because it makes the road more narrow for them to cross. So, so a neck down is a snow neck down. So you have to Google that. It's pretty interesting, and I think actually we have it in the full course too. Um, so then after we do the field exercise, then we go back into the classroom, and then we kind of go through in detail what goes into these programs how to really detail these components and then we you know our goal here is to give you this information so that you can feel comfortable and confident going and immediately implementing and starting the process of implementing a traffic calming program in your community so we're going to go through what it would take to get that implemented in your community we'll gear it towards your community we've got a a tools and resources section in this course where we go through the different tools, techniques, funding, um, programs, policies, laws, everything that would go into this just to really um, help you guys get started. And so, as I mentioned before, and Victoria's mentioned, these are free courses. Uh, so if you want to host a training in your community, here's a link to go straight to it. Um, but also, if you go to the Active Transportation page on ODOT's website and click on one of the courses, there's a, a link in each of the courses to directly apply also. Uh, so there aren't too many requirements, but we prefer that you commit to at least 15 participants and um, also have a space that we can use in your community for the training. Uh, and, not, and not everybody has 15 people they can pull together, so it's totally fun if you want to pull multiple schools in or neighboring communities or if you have a regional planning commission, have them host it and pull people together. Um, and, and so, and we can also, if you're trying, if you're struggling to get to the minimum number, you can always reach out to us and we're happy to help you with ideas on recruiting or coordinating with nearby communities to help you get there. Um, one thing that 
uh, we're starting to consider that uh, Victoria's would like to consider is starting to look at maybe some more static um, locally directed trainings that maybe like ODOT district offices or something so that it, if you're just not going to get to the 15 you can maybe sign up to some a nearby training so that's something that hopefully in this next iteration of the Academy starting in the fall we can can look at also So that is all I have for you today. I've got my contact information up on the screen. Also, just contacting Victoria directly. Uh, that will get back to us, too. And um, I definitely encourage you to check out the Active Transportation Academy website. And if you're interested in the traffic calming program specifically, feel free to sign up or uh, shoot us any more questions over email or phone. Sounds great. I did put a link to the web page with all of the course information in there. Um, plus, as you were talking about the application, I put a link to the application in the chat great. pod as well for everybody. So um, we're happy to take questions still through the chat pod, but I am going to go ahead and move into unmuting everybody. So if you've got a party going on in the background, <laughs> please go ahead and, and make sure you mute your line down. But we're happy to take questions um, from the audience at this point. So here goes the, the magic unmute. Um, so if you have a, a question, uh, make sure that you have unmuted yourself on your phone and please feel free to ask that. Um, we're more than happy to, to take those audio questions now. Everybody's afraid of asking a question on a <laughs> webinar. It's being recorded. So I, the other way, too, is to, of course, contact Kim with her um, contact information there on the screen or to contact me as well. I would be interested um, additionally in knowing if there is a, a need or a demand for individuals who would like to take the course but just can't meet that 15-person minimum because, as Kim mentioned, I, I was um, – you know, looking at possibly scheduling some sessions where people could come to them as opposed to having the session brought out to your community. Um, so you could at least get the training even if you couldn't get the 15 people in the room. So if you are interested in that, I'm going to put my um, email address in the chat pod as well. Please feel free to c contact me and let me know, and especially what area of the state you're in. So that way I can make certain to get the, the course hopefully scheduled in your district close to you. Okay, any questions? Going once, going twice. Well, Kim, thank you so much for the webinar this morning. I think it has been a really fascinating glimpse into this course. And I know even this morning there were a lot of emails going back and forth with our own district safety engineers regarding traffic calming. So I'm certain that it's a, a class that's going to get out there and the, the message will be able to be spread to help slow people down and make our roads even safer. Great. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. You too.